Shooting it raw? Yes. Shooting it raw. It sucks to have a conversation and then uh, miss the miss the image. <laughs> like I sort of check the recording afterwards and go like, oh no, oh no, what happened? Yeah. No image. Okay, so <clears throat> okay, here we go. So we're gonna start. Um, so thanks for joining me on the podcast. Today is a real treat. I've got Josh Sellers with me. Uh, I've known Josh for a long time. Uh, and it'll come out how I met him. Josh is is great. I really admire and respect how he makes images. And uh, if you check the the, um, the website, you'll see the image he submitted uh, for this this conversation. And it's just nuts. It's just uh, really just crazy. So, Josh, thank you very much for joining me. I can see it, Ram. How about one of the things? Because it's a podcast. How about you describe what I'm looking at? <clears throat> um, <laughs> well, what you're looking at is a montage uh, illustration of uh, just a series of images I've been been drawing and creating from things that I see or things I've been exposed to, and uh, the series I've been working on is a has a heavy influence of East meets West, and how I see a lot of. Um, Design crossing over and, and uh, on on both sides of here in California or the West Coast uh, compared to what I've been seeing what's going on over in China and Hong Kong and you know whether it be um, or in the way I've been seeing uh, a little bit more Asian influence or a need for Asian influence over here and on the design side uh, especially I, I'm I'm down here in Redondo Beach California and um, I. So I guess I'm trying to create uh, a bit of a visual bridge between the two and show people how much the two cultures can really learn from each other. And um, I, I like to use a, a specific color palette, which is really big and bold. Um, and also, um, I also like to bleed into using you know, like bright pinks and bright purples and colors you wouldn't normally see from... Um, I, uh, you know, a bald headed white guy. It's just, uh, you know, I, I, I like to make, I, guess I like big bright colors because I, I see a lot of great artwork out there, but uh, I don't know why artists tend to really go into dark, moody colors mm. uh, to sort of blow that whole thing up and bring out more energy yeah. and make people feel uh, a little bit more. So here's what I see. Right. Now, the thing is, I explained to Josh that this is a podcast called Shooting It Raw, which is, in principle, uh, starting off with photography. And I've known Josh uh, for 16 years. Like 15 for a, years. 15 years. A long time. 15 years. A long time. And, uh, right. and so, in a way, I've seen him, like, he's worked as a, I mean, you've worked as a graphic designer, so you've worked as a senior graphic designer for, you know, jewelry companies, for... Okay, like what are the different what are the different roles you've had um, in terms of work? <laughs> Hong Kong, uh, yeah, I worked my way through um, TSL Jewelry. So you know, came in as a graphic designer and then um, working my way up to an art director and learning a lot about branding. And I learned a lot through advertising and um, I learned a lot of ins and outs of you know. I basically got thrown in the deep end of kind of the the luxury fashion world, in a way, at least for as far as China's standards are. And then, uh, yeah, did that for a really long time. But I was doing a lot of print based work, a lot of photography, which is a lot of fun. Uh, doing a lot of art direction with photography, work with some great photographers out here in Los Angeles. And then, um, yeah, I decided I need to get back into digital, so I started getting more on a digital front. And I uh, started working with a lot of concept um, uh, digital platforms like uh, human scale, motion based interaction, um, and then I, I work with uh, work as an art director for a company, help them set up a digital ad agency, and uh, kind of work my way all the way up into um, doing a lot of hardcore digital projects for Mercedes Benz and some stuff for BMW, and yeah. On the one hand, I hear you talking about the kind of more like this is the officious story for for this podcast, which is great. 
Uh, but where have you worked in the past year? What were you doing? You're just well, telling yes, me. Yes, yes. So, <laughs> so this past year, so I, I, I came back to uh, came back to LA, and uh, so you know, reconnect with family and all that, and so. You know, and I've been working in that hardcore pace of of uh, Hong Kong and China. So, what better place to still have a little bit of madness? Um, I started working for an adult toy company, um, and uh, you know, they they brought me in to kind of bring their brand up, you know, their brand image because they didn't want to be seedy or anything like that. They want to get more onto the level of uh, lay low products, and uh, they like some of my more high end work. So, I started helping them you know, figure out their, their packaging, just getting all the brand under control. And then I got thrown into the position of, Hey Josh, can you, uh, can you design some uh, vibrators? <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, how is it that they ask a uh, man, just, did they ask a man to design a vibrator? Please tell. You know, I asked him the same question, <laughs> but I had to really sort of jump into the same bullshit as when I had to do an ad campaign in Hong Kong for this, uh, for this bra and underwear company. And, you know, we had three guys working on, um, working on ad campaign for bra and panties, which by the way, that was a very successful campaign we did. Yeah. So I kind of delved in to my inner, um, bra and panty ad campaign experience and, um, did a lot of research. That's great. On, you know, technical research about, you know, what makes a vibrator vibrate, you know, what kind of, uh, how many revolutions per second can this vibrator like buzz? And so somewhere in there, I, I managed to create one of the world's uh, most intense vibrating uh, sort of pocket vibe. Um, it's called called the uh, the bestie bullet, and uh, it's so strong it pretty much walks across the floor. Yeah, I got video <laughs> of that. Sometime I'll share that with you sometime, right? And then. Um, yeah, designed another big cock ring, you know, it, it fits. And that's uh, uh, called the big OMG. Um, <laughs> I know you as an illustrator for sure, but I also know you as a, as a photographer because you've also done high-end photography in fashion. You've done high-end photog- product photography, um, either, either actually tripping the shutter, but also just working in the art direction. So... On the one hand, I, I was expecting a photograph, but then you showed me an illustration. Now, the frame is more or less divided in half, right? The bottom half is kind of like looking under, uh, underwater, and the top half is like, you see, there's definitely this kind of water. There are these two kind of koi fish kind of looking up. There's a, the water is being zippered open on both sides. There are pagodas dark palette pagodas and as you say you use a different kind of palette because the reds are very very bright uh crawling across are one two three four five five uh tigers and then let's see there's also these heads of these of these slightly asian looking blonde women and leaves sprouting out of their foreheads i mean it's a visually i mean your images are always quite visually arresting and they're quite uh strong and if there's a connection from this to photography proper photography you know with a camera okay so how would you make that connection with photography um so uh, a lot of the inspiration from uh for this illustration is from past trips um throughout asia so the the sort of temple pagoda looking buildings are actually out of uh, Kathmandu, Nepal. So some of the images that I've I've made over there and um, uh, the Koi are obviously, you know, just something you see all over Asia, but uh, I was really kind of inspired by a trip I did down to uh, Bali. Uh, I I got to stay at this really kick-ass resort under some really weird circumstances. Um, It was like this crazy... uh, Four Seasons private residence kind of thing, and it was just like a weird, crazy koi ponds all over the place. And so I sat down and started photographing the koi, then I started drawing them. Um, and a lot of it is this, I kind of read this quote from Dolly a long time ago where someone asked him, where do you get your inspiration from? He goes, oh, it's just things I've seen over my lifetime, you know, whether it be a 
piano being dragged up a cliff or, or a, uh, you know, someone burning a clock and something melted or some sort. I don't know, I'm like paraphrasing here. But um, so a lot of it is from trips that I've done, and I'm really trying to also relay my experiences, what I've seen behind the lens. Um, for, you know, I've uh, been asked to go out and shoot sort of postcard type photo- photography around Asia. So I did that a lot for a while. And um, uh, I'm doing a bit of that out here, out here in the U.S. as well. So I've got a few companies that asked me to go out and shoot stuff for their uh, their Instagram content or whatnot. So I go out and do that. So, yeah, it's just stuff that I've seen. Um, and some, some of the illustration stuff, it could be um, some of it's uh, – street art that i've seen and i'll redraw i'll like i'll redraw it and throw my own interpretation of it and um so i'm inspired by stuff i see in the street art scene as well and just make a montage of everything Mm -hmm. and again it's just trying to bleed things i'm seeing over asia things i'm seeing over here in the the west and what what camera are you shooting with right now this is mechanical. So what, what are you, what camera? Um, uh, I got a couple of cameras. My main camera I shoot with is a uh, Canon Mark three, one DS. It was a big beast, you know, like if I'm like you know, run out of shooting with my card, I could just, you know, start throwing it around the street. If I get bored, it's just a burly hefty machine. Yeah. Uh, when I go in the studio, um, yeah, like I'll shoot with a Hasselblad and with the leaf digital back. So I mean, high end um, gear, definitely high end gear. Well, I'm, I'm also starting to, I've been toying around with, uh, you know, I've got a GoPro Hero 8 and, um, or a GoPro 8. Um, and, uh, so I've been toying with playing with really small format cameras and, uh, but toying around with video now these days. And, uh, that's given me a lot of inspiration to draw even more, but I've also been animating a lot of my illustrations as well mm. as I start getting into, uh, creating more, more kind of, you know, movable content. Mm. So, um, I don't know, there's just so many mediums to play with now. And, and, uh, so I'm making the the most out of my hardware, but trying to bleed it into old techniques as well. Mm. I remember at one point you went out and your work at TSL, you know, and you're doing like, you, you, you actually gone out and you went and you got that Olympus, right? (laughs) So what was the first camera? Sorry, I remember. Yeah, because I, I, it's funny because there was a time where, where you were kind of we're, – we're in Hong Kong. We're doing lots of stuff together. It was really fun, a lot of hiking, all that, that business. Uh, and then there was like this moment where you said, OK, I'm going to go. And, and you got yourself this pretty nice, I guess, you know, um, it wasn't a full frame. It was like a whatever frame. It was like a smaller frame uh, Olympus. And you're shooting with that. But was that was that your first real digital camera or, or would you – because for some reason in my mind, it's like you – I didn't really associate you as a, as a photography or in photography, but, but I did associate you in, um, with uh, uh, graphic design. Yeah, I think I'd say a really, well, you know, I actually got into photography back in high school. I was a you know, typical, got into the whole yearbook thing, and um, parents had a, a, an old camera, which actually I, I dug out of storage the other day. Um, it's like this uh, little beat up consumer brands like Nikon N2000. Um, and I started shooting a lot of black and white. And then uh, the the program I had back in school, like, you know, we were able to go and develop our own film and all that. And, you know, I, I had a lot of fun with that. So photography was always kind of in my ear a little bit. Um, and then uh, fast forward to, I think, about 2003, uh, some friends and I were partying a lot. We we're kind of at the center of this whole rave scene in Seattle uh, with our art studios and whatnot back then, a whole Burning Man thing. And a friend of mine gave me this little, uh, I, don't, I don't remember what kind of camera. It was just like one of those little handheld, must have been you know, like a three megapixel digital camera he was throwing out. So I'll take it. Took some shots. That was kind of fun. And then uh, I went on this big commercial photo shoot my first big shoot uh when i worked at tsl with this uh world famous photographer named uh, jim jordan and um he uh, really took the time to uh, show me the world of photography and it really inspired me watching the shoot watching Charlie work with the models and and uh you know working as uh trying to help him storyboard some stuff and it's just like wow 
this is amazing. I, I got to get into this. And then of course I was hanging out with you and you did your big, um, you know, 350 rants and did I get that right? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. That was an amazing project. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, I picked up the E300 and I yeah. uh, just started shooting everything I could you know, with the trouble and all that. That camera actually got stolen out of my backpack in the Philippines. <laughs> um, and, you know, and I know who did it. Oh, no. It was, uh, it was a drag moat race. And it's crazy. I don't know. But uh, then I did another big shoot in 2008 with, uh, with Jim Jordan. And um, and I bit the bullet. And uh, that's when I bought my Mark III. And I uh, started taking photography a lot more seriously. And um, um, But then spending a lot of time in the studio doing product photography. So we're shooting these uh, yeah, multi-million dollar pieces of jewelry and diamonds and just with big macro cameras and uh it just got me more and more into you know seeing light a lot differently and shaping light especially in a studio environment trying to shape light but then when you bring that out into the street uh and start doing photography when you're traveling then you're definitely looking at light a, a lot differently right it's right, actually right. just changed the way i look at eye pathways and, and whatnot you know when, when you were in india where was kevin do where was it uh uh, that that one image you have trip. of the reflection is bonkers. Oh, that was the, that was like Kashmir or Pakistan or something like that. Some friends and I went out and uh, did this uh, snowboarding trip. Yeah. And um, yeah, we decided to go snowboarding in the Himalayas, and so we went to some pretty whacked out places. And uh, yeah, the I ended up getting this great shot one morning. Yeah, it was Kashmir. I was on uh, Lake Dahl, and uh, we just wrapped up. Uh, our time up in the mountains and so we're getting ready to head back to, to Hong Kong and uh, so I got this guy to take me out in a boat about 6 in the morning it's freezing cold and um, and we come out of this little uh, it's like a little field but on the water kind of come through these little like water reeds and the, the water was like a pane of reflective glass. It was like a mirror, and uh, these buildings are sitting there. The giant background uh, is is uh, mountains, and it was just a picture perfect mirror reflection. Snapped a few shots, and um, I mean, seriously, I, that image. Yeah. If you can, if you can send that to me to post that on the site so people can look at that. That was one of the images that you had made, and I was just like, "Wow, you know." I mean, because before then, I knew you. You're very accomplished as a as a commercial uh, graphic designer, and and I you really admired uh, how you worked. But um, but then when I saw that image, I was just like, "That's that's you know." I don't think of the word sublime very often. Yeah, you know, it's not one I use, but that was just when I saw that. It was jaw droppingly beautiful. I was like, "Wow, that's that's just crazy." Um. Yeah, that was a that was a great set of shots. Actually, I got so many, so many great shots from that trip. Um, and I'll back up in a little bit on the inspiration of doing the travel photography was actually the the surfing trip we did in Sri Lanka, where we went out and uh, I had my E three hundred and uh, took a little day off from surfing and ran out into the back railroad tracks and just photographed everything I could. And yeah, got some great shots of that got some good feedback from people and that really sparked it right definitely to go out and do more travel photography but like a like some <laughs> somebody who's coming into photography who's saying okay what how do i get my how do i wrap my, my head around this because the me the mechanics are all kind of uh taken care of in a way so where do you think photography is now right in terms like that's why when you send me the the collage i'm just like yeah i'm going to use it because it's kind of it's all about the image and, and all this stuff. So, so where do you where do you see your photography right now, or your your relationship to cameras and all that stuff? You know, I take a very kind of I don't know old school, keep it simple, pragmatic approach to photography myself, because I don't. We'll be back a little bit and say where I see the state of photography at the moment is that um, it's quick and easy. For everyone, everyone has access to incredible cameras just on their phones alone. You can say if you have that iPhone 11, it does all this cool stuff, but it kind of takes the picture for you. I'm sorry, makes the picture for you, really. Um, and I, I find it a bit frustrating because actual photography has become so cheap 
and the standards, the high bars have gone lower. And so what's being put out there content wise is that people are, um, are now used to, you know, quick over, uh, over saturated or, or over, uh, polished images they might see on Instagram or Facebook. Um, but I think uh, the art of photography, of like old school, you know, like let it, let an exposure sit for a while without getting a star stream so you can uh, capture a great night shot and make it look like it's day, but everyone knows it's night and minds are blown. People don't really take the time to do that anymore um, mm. in, in general. And there's a lot of great photographers who are still practicing the old school ways about really getting the no exposures and, and uh, you know, you know not creating too much noise with a high ISO when it during a dark shot right. or something. Um, or just, you know, seeing great studio shots by shaping some great light. I think, you know, people don't really take the time or, or on a commercial aspect, companies aren't seeing the value in creating a great image. Okay. Um, so that, that's where I see the state of photography so, right so, now. So don't, um, don't, hopefully don't. it goes back. Don't take this the wrong way, but is this the mindset you brought into and you're making uh, dildo photographs? Did, wait, did you make dildos oh, or yeah. vibrators? So, so, oh, this is exciting. This, okay, this is an exciting subject. For I me. want to hear you. Now look at your face. So excited. Okay, great. Great. Go for it. <laughs> the state of photography today. state of photography today is... So when I went to go work for this company for a little bit, and uh, it, it seemed like an okay gig for a while, and it was certainly amusing and interesting, and uh, you know, it's a, it's a company I just I went in there, did what I do, just kind of got them on track and left because it's going, come on, this going from Mercedes Benz to to uh, dildos, it's just not my gig. But um, but I do remember having the owner of the company plop a, a an extra large butt plug on my desk. <laughs> I said, Josh, we need, we need to work up great photography for this product. And I'm sort of like, I was just silent. And so I went in there. And, of course, me being me, I have, I have a high bar standard. So like, hey, I don't care if it's a butt plug or a diamond ring. This thing is going to shine. Um, like, you're right. So, so I lit this thing up. I spent some time shaping the light, just getting the right lines. Not, I didn't, I didn't want the piece to be, you know, too overbearing or aggressive. Yeah, of course, for obvious reasons. Yeah. And, and I, I wanted to look a little bit high end and all that. And I remember getting high end. I love the high end. Kind of, like, <laughs> right, it's like yeah, the high end for the low end. So good. Um, so. Uh, so, so yeah, I remember just kind of going, hey, you know, Josh, you're, you're really spending a lot of time lighting this thing. I'm like, look, you guys want a high end for the low end. That's what you're going to do. If you're going to do it, if you're gonna do it I set up my shot. I mean, I haven't seen the image, but I'm okay. sure you, it's the it's the Louis Vuitton of butt plugs. It is interesting because it does have a remote vibrator, so you can pop that bad boy in <laughs> and your partner can buzz you from across the room. Um, what, what happened to you, Josh? What happened to you? What happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> I was feeling old and I needed the money. Um, I, awesome. I don't know. It just it was there. I found it kind of amusing. I thought of you briefly when I took the job. Going, oh, Rand, Rand's going to love this story. Rand is going to love um, this story. Yes. <laughs> I, you know, it was it was just a filler gig until I figured out some other stuff I was going to work on. And um, you know, being in LA, it was a really it was really close to home, so I didn't have to deal with the commuting traffic. Still, stay local. Be off work at five o'clock and be in the surf by five thirty. Oh, sweet! sweet. And um, so, yeah, so got a lot of surfing done uh, at the expense of a uh, sex toy company. Right, right. Um, so the, the the background of this <laughs> of this conversation that we're having now, right, is that I just 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 got back from being in Savannah for like six weeks or seven weeks uh fleeing the the, the covid19 <laughs> coronavirus um i you know my daughter and i left when you know when it started things started going a little bit crazy here so we left for savannah to kind of get away from what's happening in hong kong and then after about seven weeks in savannah all of a sudden the cases started coming up in, in georgia so it's like okay okay let's go back to hong kong so we came back to hong kong now, um, a lot of people are discovering that they can do remote work 
right? And with digital photography, you think, yeah, you can do that like, to a certain extent. So how do you feel the world is sort of reorienting? Because right now, so much is digital, so people can work remotely, right? So how do you feel things are, 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 um, are changing in that sense? Or are they? Is it even a good question? Yeah, I think it's a good question, especially for what's going on. Um, I, I, I'm seeing the positive in this with the whole uh, working from home and all that. I think uh, companies are being really archaic and they're thinking of, uh, I mean, a lot, a lot of companies. Like some companies, you need people there, you know, depending on what industry is. You know, I work in the digital and in design industry, so therefore I don't see the reason why you need to have an office and massive overhead. I might see the point of maybe having meetings uh, or good brainstorming sessions, but when I see companies that can actually leverage all the great technology that's out there and create new systems to allow people a little bit more freedom and a little bit more trust in the people they're hiring to get the job done, mm. um, I think it's a great wake-up call for companies to go, let's do this. Let's cut overhead um, on office space and office machines and this and this and that. Let's go all digital. Um, you know, we cut down on massive waste. Uh, with paper and copies and all this other crap or just unnecessary items. Um, I, I think it could actually open up some industries mm -hmm. uh, to create more ease for telecommuting. Um, I do that quite a bit as I work as a freelance artist and designer. Um, I'm actually out in the Mojave Desert putting up climb routes and uh, come back, do a bit of work, ride on my mountain bike, right out to a hotspot so I have my mobile phone signal X, you know, put my work up in the cloud, right back to camp, and um, it seems to work out great. That's, that's awesome. So, why not give why not get people out of the office <laughs> and allow them to be a little bit more responsible um, for their own work? You yeah, know, I think companies can. Yeah, companies can save a lot of money. Let's just say you're you're a beginning uh, photographer. You just come out of university or whatever, and. Um, you're like, okay, how am I going to, ultimately people kind of fall into opportunities, right? What, what I really liked about our conversations, uh, before was, uh, you really have an understanding, I'd say a very high level understanding of, of, you know, commercial branding, uh, of, of essentially how companies can create the right identity for themselves. Right. <clears throat> so what, that's a kind of a, in a way, like, let's just say you're standing in front of a, of a classroom or people, or, or I don't want to say, I don't put the, pick the image of a student, of somebody necessarily in their 20s or whatever, I mean, at, at any age. But what is the lesson that you would give, or what can you, you say to, to people about what they need to think about in today's sort of market expectations or whatever in terms of how to create a brand or, or not so for example you're creating you're creating dildos okay great so how do you make the connection of a branding to like elevate a vibrator company versus elevating a uh mid-range mid-tier uh jewelry company with selling diamonds so how would you teach that uh, that's a big question um there's, there's a few answers to that one being one of the biggest hangups that I see them having, uh, and I've actually uh, had a conversation with a, a Uber driver the other day uh, who said he's he's just recently got into photography. Do I have any tips? I said, yeah, go out and shoot. Mm -hmm. Go out and sh shoot, shoot what you can, and when you get comfortable shooting something, get out of your comfort zone and go shoot something else and get really good at it and find that connection. Now, when it comes into the branding side, you know, it's really about just developing your style throughout a lot of shooting and different shooting techniques. You know, you develop your own style and you look at a product because you've shot a bunch of different things at this point. And uh, you think, how am I going to tell a good story? How am I going to tell a good story that matches the voice of this brand? And on the branding side, I, I pose this question to any company I go and do branding with as so i asked them about their brand i go so your brand is a person and that person goes to a party what what does that person talk about at that party and how does that person come across to others and that's your brand because whoever you're coming across to others you know it's really that gut feeling that people have about 
your company, your products, your service, that's that's your brand right there. So your photography should relay that conversation that that brand's having at the party. Mm. So is it dark and moody? Is it is it deep? Is it bright and happy and cheerful? Then you need to shoot for that. And that's that's a, some foundations that I take into branding. And, and if I'm shooting or studying or drawing up storyboards for shoot, um, that's something. That's the feedback I take back from the company when I pose that question to mm-hmm. them. Okay, so photography is kind of in a way in how you're doing. Okay, so. For the commercial stuff, you set it up. It's very, very well planned, right? You have a storyboard and you plan it and it's not – It's sure. you don't want it to be accidental, right? Uh, there may sure. be some happy yeah, accidents. But then the, the other stuff, when you go traveling, you're kind of recording what you see and in a way pushing yourself into these uh, uncomfortable situations will reveal things for yourself. Okay. And then you're kind of recording what you see. But so the question, the qu- finally getting to it is – when you're making the illustrations, right, where you're essentially you're pulling you're pulling out graphics from previous photographs, and then you're creating these illustrations. In the photography, you're essentially recording what's in front of you and what you stumble upon. In the illustration, you're essentially synthesizing something. What? How much discovery is there in your in your illustration? But I, I try to actually make something for an audience. To actually kind of cheer them up. I, I think we're in kind of some funny times right now. Mm-hmm. I think people are I'm kind of making fun of the uh, media chaos that we have, and and not not just talking like news media. I'm talking about we're over we're in an oversaturated visual market right now. Like there's just so much shit going on. We're taking in so much that I think people are just getting burned out on the digital front. So in a way, I'm kind of making fun of that. That's why there's so much chaos going on mm-hmm. in my. Um, in my illustrations, but there's also repetition. So you always kind of see a bit of repetition. So there's always, uh, I have eye pathways in there. So you are actually, the way you're looking at that illustration is planned. Mm -hmm. Uh, I really kind of plan out eye pathways because I actually do that stuff in my own commercial photography. So I have a lot of stuff going on. But one thing I really enjoy about the illustration side is that while I'm drawing or putting together a crazy montage and getting into the color and the textures is I'm problem solving. Like I've got other, say if I'm working on an app design or a website design or a brand issue, um, I'm problem solving in my head. And for me, illustration is uh, kind of come into uh, an issue with composition of this thing and I find a solution to it, or uh, this texture isn't working, or uh, the side is just, the colors aren't contrasting enough to really get that feel I want, so let's figure out some other colors here. And it's a funny ecosystem I I find with my design and branding and all the end of photography is is a constant bit of, uh, I know there's always a solution to problems. Mm -hmm. You know, if you get into any subject, like for me, um, I love branding. I, I I love every aspect of it. Um, you know, and I and I love all the opportunities I've had to uh, learn about everything it takes to make a brand a living, breathing thing. Yeah, that can sit well in someone's stomach. You know, um, I'd say I was fortunate enough to get really focused in that area and um you know i just went after it you know consuming any sort of brand lecture or uh or brand related book or uh any any sort of exercise or medium that relates to you know building a brand you know all the way into writing um you know it's like you know writing however you come across in your writing does that relate to the same tone as the image and whatnot and and i can go on and on about that but really my advice for anybody would be if you find a subject you know and you get into it like get into it Mm -hmm. like it's it's, what i do in design and branding i I don't look at it as a job you know it's just a lifestyle right for me you know it's like uh it's just something i'm really into or mindset you'd be into stamps well 
get out there and start collecting some stamps, man. Right? I yeah. think I, I lick those things, stick up the things, and get them <laughs> I think I just I think we just stumbled upon the title of this podcast, which is going to be like the diamonds and dildos, <laughs> understanding branding. Yes. Hey, from your history, what is what is the one time you had an image of yours get a gave you a really big rush? What did you say that that was? Oh, that's a that's, that's a big one. Um, I, I I can answer that question, but it's going to be it's going to go a little bit of a different route. It's actually kind of funny. Um, Shooting I, it raw, brother. Just go for it. This weird jewelry brand called Enzo for a while, um, trying to help them with their branding. And part of that was I had to go in the studio and shoot this really complex uh, table of a diamond. So a table being when you're, you're you're kind of looking down at the crown, you're looking at the flat bit of the diamond. And um, and I was hyper meticulous about the shooting. It was a flawless diamond. Oh, I think it was like a, yeah, it must have been like a D class. Yeah, just beautiful, bright, shiny diamond. And so we shoot this thing, and uh, I spent a lot of time in the post-production just taking out a little bit of dust bits here and there. I'm really hyper-meticulous about this. I wanted to capture all the facets and all that. And uh, we launched this thing and went all around billboards all over China in a certain advertising. Now, the only the thing that happened was that diamond never died in that the printing company or, or, or that or the media buy company – that uh, I submitted the artwork to went on and and they, to this day they still resell that image to other companies and so anytime I'm up in China I'm guaranteed to see this image wow that is my image I mean, you know, I never get paid for any of that kind of stuff or no 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 royalties just like a blatant rip off but to this day um, oh god you know it's been like uh, you know 12 years later you know, I can go up to China and still find this image being used. That's cool. Kind of thing. And every time I see that, it, 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 it gives me a bit of a rush, like, I guess it's a good photo. I mean, I should be upset about this. <laughs> yeah. Not because, well, good, because they're still using this. And thing. it's really big. But yeah, it's awesome. That, that's cool. <laughs> that's cool, man. So, but of course, it's always nice to see uh, if I do a big ad campaign uh and see my images uh, in different countries is always really cool. You see up on a big billboard and kind of sit there and laugh a little bit. Sure. If a model is wearing one of my wearing one of my shirts or something because you know we were missing something in wardrobe and you know, my God, that's my shirt. <laughs> and this is a billboard. What's going on? <laughs> it's kind of cool. Okay, so um, I think this is, we're gonna wrap this up a little bit. Uh, what I want to do is I'm gonna put up uh, I'm gonna post links to your images. Um, to your sites, to, to where people can see your stuff. Um, yeah, Josh, I mean, I, I, I love talking to you. I love talking to you. And, and you're, you're, yeah, I really like talking shop with you. It's really cool. Anytime.